The following live broadcast may contain loud, obnoxious, shrill, and alarming noises uh, that might be considered disturbing, if not outright uncomfortable to listen to, especially if you are wearing headphones. But hopefully we'll luck out today because he's sleeping right now. I share my office space with an African gray parrot and two parakeets, and I have no control over their behavior while I am live streaming, unlike my regular videos where I have the opportunity to edit them out as best as I can. If you are sensitive to loud, surprising background noises, I recommend not turning your volume up too loud or watching my edited pre-recorded videos instead. Viewer discretion is advised. But like I said, um, everybody's sleeping right now. So hopefully we'll luck out um, and have a weird noiseless uh, show today. Um, it's kind of overcast. It's a little rainy. Uh, so yeah, I guess like everybody is just like taking advantage and just sleeping. So <laughs> So welcome everybody to another live stream, another draw stream here at the Eagle Works. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure, like I said, it's kind of a hazy overcast day today. And um, I almost thought I wasn't going to run a stream. So uh, I ended up putting the uh, the notice about an hour before I was going to go live. Um, I had to run a couple of errands and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to finish them uh, in time before the stream. But I was able to kind of make it under the wire, um, but I wasn't able to put out the notifications um, as far in advance as I would have preferred to. But you know what? Whatever. Uh, the work still needs to get done regardless. So might as well just run a stream anyway. Um, so let me see. So let me see who's joining me in this in, in the chat. Hello, Joseph. Hello, welcome. And yes, I see you, the currently one very sleepy eyeball person <laughs> on my screen uh, right now, watching us from regions beyond. Um, if you're joining me uh, from Facebook, come on over to YouTube. Join uh, Joseph in the chat. Keep him company <laughs> while we do some artwork here. Um, as you can, as you know, you've probably noticed by now. I don't. I don't stream to Twitter anymore because they don't even allow me to see your chats, uh, your comments. So I, I didn't see the point of it. And Facebook has a tendency to act up. And, uh, you know, so if you want to uh, have a direct conversation with me on the air, YouTube is the best place to do it. And Twitch, if you are joining us uh, from Twitch as well. Um so yeah, so thank you so uh, so much for everybody uh, watching. And uh, yeah, so I might as well get the introductions uh, going. So hello everyone, my name is Daphne Lage and I'm a cartoonist, illustrator and comic book artist from New York. I've been so, I have been still publishing comics since 1992 and you know what that means. You really wanna know my process? Absolutely. Usually starts with a holla and ends with a creamsicle. And then if there's time in between, Thundercats. Ho! And I am known for the furry fantasy adventure Tall Tales, especially Tall Tales or So I Thought, which is in its last 43 hours on Kickstarter. So make sure that uh, you don't miss out on this first full color, hopefully first but not last, uh, full color Tall Tales short story. If you've never heard of the series before, uh, this is actually the perfect story to jump on. Uh, it's a self-contained short story called or, or, or So I Thought, and it is a prequel to the main storyline. Uh, so yeah, so this would be the, uh, the the campaign to try it out on. So link links are in the show notes below. And I am also known for my mature audience Audiences, medieval fantasy soap opera drama Eager Raven, Heir of the First Unicorn, which returns to Kickstarter August 2nd with issue seven. Could you believe that? Seven issues already. I mean, I'm currently inking issue eight and it's like, ugh, you know, <laughs> so it's like, I mean, we're just like full speed ahead. But yes, it returns to Kickstarter. Uh, I 
August 2nd uh, with uh, issue seven. Link is in the show notes below for the pre-launch page. So the pre-launch page is live for this campaign. So if you want to make sure you don't miss out when the campaign goes live, go, to, go on over to Kickstarter uh, from the link in the show notes and hit the notify me button and they will send you a nice tidy email uh, to tell you when the campaign goes live so you don't miss anything. And I am also co-host with Anita Lanning uh, on the Rage Into the Vlogs show every Monday and Friday at 11 a.m. on the Indie Comics Network. So yes, if you, you're either watching this on my main uh, channel or um, <laughs> which also simulcasts through the Indie Comics Network. So make sure you like, subscribe and hit the thumbs up button, then the thumbs down button because the algorithm doesn't care which ones you, you press. And make sure you hit the little bell so you get notified whenever any of our shows go live. Um, and remember, you can read both my comics online uh, here at Tall Tales, T-A-I-L-S online.com and egoworks.com, E-G-O-W-O-R-K-S. And as I stated before, you can check out all my videos on how I make my comics here on YouTube at Daphne Lage, it's L-A-G-E-R, which also simulcasts through the Indie Comics Network. So like I said, make sure you smash, squeeze, and press all those, all, all those buttons to get all that value algorithm juice out of them so <laughs> oh hello jim o'reilly hello hello you know, um so yeah so that's uh Ah, so that, uh, yeah. So what other housekeeping do I have? I don't really have that, that much housekeeping. That, that was pretty much it. I mean, it's like, again, you know, it's, it's the, it's the end of the month. Um, you know, <laughs> felt like yesterday it was already the end of the month <laughs> for last month. Um, we're just creeping into July right now. So I am, uh, you know, finishing up, uh, you know, trying to finish it, finish up whatever I can, uh, to the end of the month so that the to-do list gets reset. And uh, yeah, and for those of you uh, who are following along or maybe just joining me today. So yes, so Eagle Raven, Heir of the First Unicorn issue um, eight is currently in production right now. Um, I'm, I'm already up to issue, uh, up, up to page, I wish, page uh, seven on um on Eagle Raven issue eight. So that's on schedule. It's like, I'm just like full speed ahead on that. Um, Clip Studio Paint has become an absolute game changer when it comes to my scheduling. And um, I'm I'm moving ahead a along on this book a lot further than if I had done it uh, traditionally on paper. Um, I know that it kind of like, you know, it, it kind of like contradicts what I've always said that it's like, you know, it's like, oh, it's like, if you're not getting your hands dirty, um, are you really doing it right? And it's like, well, you know what, in the end, it's like my schedule um, ended up superseding um, my need to do things traditionally, um, especially with the amount of work that I've been getting done as, as, uh, I guess as quickly as I have been, I mean, being able to work, uh, on my comic book pages in Clip Studio Paint and being able simultaneously to do pencils and inks whenever I need to without having to switch anything out, without having to stop what I'm doing. Um, if there's something weird in a panel that I need to fix, I could just do it then and there um, as opposed to worrying about tracing and light boxing and bringing it to Photoshop and you know, going all this whole roundabout way, which I'm sure... Um, you know, added a lot to my tendency to procrastinate. Um, and instead, just by being able to do everything in this program, um, I've just been able to, to work at, at a pretty good, you know, pretty steady clip. Um, without too many interruptions. So I'm, I'm really happy with that. You know, it's like, it's like, look, sometimes, uh, you know, you kind of have to put, you know, you kind of have to put your own nonsense away to kind of get things done. Um, so does that mean that I've stopped doing completely traditional artwork? Absolutely not. Um, there's a commission that I'm finishing that I just got approval for on the digital pencils. And what I'm going to be doing is um, doing the minor changes that the commission wanted, uh, creating blue lines and then printing them onto paper and then finishing the commission off. 
on paper, um, only to just bring it back uh, into Photoshop so I can color it. But, uh, you know, the, the traditional part of it, it's going to be traditionally inked, you know, and whatnot. So, um, it, yeah, it just means that I'm going to be doing a lot less of it as, you know, I continue, you know, trying to get all this work done in a timely manner. So, um, again, um, if you, you know, you're curious about Clip Studio Paint, um, I can't recommend it enough. Um, it was really surprising as to how quickly it took me. Like, finally, when I, when I got over the hump, how quickly I just took to the program. Um, and really, it's like, and how suited it is for doing comics. I mean, this program really is made for comic book work. Um, even my tablet, uh, my Wacom tablet um, is um, working at optimal level because of the program working optimally. So uh, I'm just really happy with that. So that's, you know, so, so that's in production. So issue eight is in production. Um, Eagle Raven, the Unicorn King's daughter. Um, that one is the inking is also complete as well. Uh, the Medieval Unicorn Viking Slut Adults Only Supplement is also done inking wise. Um, uh, like I had stated before, uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sit on these uh, pages for a bit. And um, the closer, you know, the, the, the closer we get to probably September, that's when I'm going to like get back probably in August, I'll probably like bring them out and, and get to coloring them. Um, you know, to get that done for the next campaign. So, um, you know, cause it's like, you know, it's like I've been working on them for so long. So uh, I wanna get through as much as issue eight as possible because when September rolls around, I want to pencil out completely nine, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, that, th those, uh, that completes the uh, third volume of uh, Eagle Raven. And honestly, if I'm feeling really ambitious, uh, probably Probably, you know, depending on how my groove is um, with those pencils, probably I might try to finish complete the series. Um, but then again, I do have two more Tall Tales issues uh, that um, I have to finish as well, because uh, we, we're already discussing, you know, like, uh, you know, like which Tall Tales uh, campaigns we're going to be doing for next year. And uh, we are going to be re-releasing issues one through issues one through five of Tears of the Mother, which is the, which is the current story arc that's running on the website right now. That's the brand new uh, story arc after Thieves, uh, after Thieves Quest. And um, we're going to be doing a campaign re-releasing issues one through five, along with the brand new issue six. Uh, so what I'm looking on doing is um, remastering all the covers, like really going through, uh, you know, like fixing up, you know, you know, grammar mistakes and, and whatnot. Um, some mistakes that I caught on, on the previous, you know, printings, uh, fixing that up, uh, probably redoing the covers, but mostly recoloring them or re-inking them, you know, depending on how I feel about the covers. Uh, there's some of them that I that I do want to tweak a bit. Um, it's my older coloring style, so I want them to be consistent with uh, the previous books that I've been putting out. So um, that's what I want to do with that. So uh, that's also on the docket as well, because like we want to do, uh, we want to release those issues. I have issues seven and eight, that I have to also do as well. Um, and then it's like, we wanna put out the first trade paperback of that. And then hopefully by 2025, Jesus will have the uh, the, the last trade paperback uh, for Tall Tales as well, before we have to work on an entirely new story arc. Um, you know, very exciting stuff. I mean, it, it's a lot of, uh, you know, it, it just, you know, that that's why I'm always kind of frantic about the end of the month and resetting the to-do list. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, you know, so I, I'm pretty much, I, I think I'm, I'm in a, I'm in good shape. Um, like I said, Clip Studio Paint has really allowed me um, to work more efficiently uh, and more consistently than I was doing before. So I'm really, really happy uh, with that. Um 
Oh, it's like, oh, hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. And uh, oh, Michael, it's like, uh, do you have any recommendations for what to read to learn what the logistics are involved in a Kickstarter and the costs that go with the, with the logistics? Oh, um, oh, my goodness. There's a very specific book. <laughs> Let's see. It's the woman who does Boston Metaphys the Boston Metaphysical Society. Um, she actually wrote a book. Um, if Hold on. Let me look that up. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Kickstarter. Let me go to Kickstarter and let me look up. Let's see. Boston Metaphysical. Boston Metaphysical. Oh, yeah. Here we go. So uh, Madeline Holly Rosen. Rosing. Madeline Holly Rosing. Um, she wrote a book um, about how to do a, a Kickstarter. It's a, a, how to, how to do Kickstarters. Um, it's a very basic, uh, hold on. Let me, let me see if I could, uh, find her book. Um, let me see. Let me see. Well, this is her Boston metaphysical page. Okay. Let me see. Does she, does she have that? Ah, here we go. Here we go. Uh, let me, um, okay, so let me share the screen. So, okay, so, so okay, I'm gonna, okay, so let me share the screen so I can show you this book. Um, share screen. Ah, here we go. So funny, you should uh, say if my screen's going to get really, really weird here. Hold on. So let me just let me just do it like this. OK, there we go. So here it is. So this is the book uh, that I recommend you start off with Kickstarter for the Independent Creator uh, by M uh, by uh, <laughs> by M. Holly Rosing. Um, uh, this it's, it's a very basic book. Um, and if you're just starting out on this, I would recommend getting this book. Um, you know, but also it's like in the end, it's like, um, what I also recommend that you do too is, uh, look at other people's campaigns, um, see what they're doing. Um, if you could talk directly with other people who have, um, who, who have done Kickstarter as well. I guess technically that's what you're doing right now, right? Um, you know, that talk to them as well if you have any hyper-specific um, questions about that. But if you, but because you asked for, uh, you know, what to read, uh, it's actually right here. So Kickstarter for the Independent Creator by M. Holly Rosing. Um, she does a whole bunch of Kickstarters uh, for, for her book, uh, Boston Metaphysical Society. So if you want to check out um, her, you know, like what her campaigns look like and the type of books that she does, um, that uh, I would I would recommend, uh, I, I would recommend that. You see how easy that was? <laughs> See how easy that was. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. You see, there's a book for everything, right? Someone's, someone's made a book. Um, also, uh, there's this other book that I've also been reading, uh, that I've also been kind of obsessing about it's, um, hold on. Do I have it here? Oh, I, I don't have it in my, uh, in, in my thing here, but it's called the, the one hour, the, the one hour content plan. Um, let me just make uh, sure that I'm giving you the right name for that. So this is a book that I bought off of Amazon. Um, I bought it for Kindle. Ah, here we go. Uh oh, uh, that's just, uh, that's the chapter that I'm on. Um, let's see. Where's my cover? Cover. Okay, so this is the book, The One Hour Content Plan, that I've been um, really obsessing right now, which I think would be really good to, um, to you know, to kind of like work with the other book as well, because all the... All, it's like you could know everything about the algorithm for Kickstarter, but if you don't know how to market your own book... Um, you're going to have a harder time with it. So, um, this is good. So this would be the other book that I would recommend, uh, for, um, oh, Hey Jens. Hello. I, yeah, I see your comment. Hello. Hello. 
you know, hey, hey, lucky Neko. Um, yeah, so I would recommend those two books to start off with. Um, because uh, yeah, because I think that you know you could know all the rules about Kickstarter, but yeah, but if if you don't know how to actually talk about your own book and what to focus on and um like how you know like and who to market your book for, like I said, you're gonna have a little bit of a harder time. So I say combine you know to get those two books to start off with, and I think that you'll be headed in the right direction. Um, I I'm pretty the 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 one hour content plan i like i said i got it off of uh, amazon I, I got that and another book from the same author has a yellow cover on it uh, i just forgot what it was called i think it's like the one the, the one minute marketing plan the, i think the other one's the one minute marketing and this was the one hour content um i got both of those books for seven bucks for for the kindle um because Kindles are just a lot easier for me now. I, I mean, it's like, here I am. I used to talk a lot of shit about, oh, I can't read stuff on, on the, my phone. I can't do any physical copies. But ever since I upgraded my phone, I do all my reading on my phone now. So um, so I got the two books on Kindle uh, for seven bucks. So, you know, get if you can get the both of them, do that. Uh, I'm pretty sure the other book is also the Kickstarter book might be also available on Kickstarter, uh, not Kickstarter, on uh, on Amazon as well. So, you know, just make it easier for yourself. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so that's uh, that that's part of. Uh, Let's see. So what else, what else have I been doing? Um, well, I mean, so for today, as you can see on my screen over here, we are going to be continuing to work in Clip Studio Paint, uh, except what I'm, except now what I'm going to be doing is that if you caught, or if you didn't catch House of Bob on a Saturday, which is kind of a bit of a train wreck of an episode, it was incredibly hot in, in both our offices, both mine and Nita's offices, and we were kind of addled by that. So we weren't, we were, we didn't really put on our best show. But everybody kept saying that they really, really liked the piece that I was working on. Uh, so I still needed to finish it. But because of this, you know, because we're on more the gen general audiences um, side of YouTube, um, it is a censored version. So when I'm done with this uh with, with this variant cover, there's going to be two versions of it on the uh, medi Medieval Unicorn Viking Select campaign. So there's going to be the nude version, and then there's going to be the kind of like the censored, you know, main version uh, for people who just want to be able to collect the covers and have them out without their mom looking at them funny. Uh, so, uh, so there's going to be these two variants uh, on the campaign. This is the last cover um, that uh, I'm doing for for that campaign. I have a lot of covers, variant covers. Um, if you're the type that likes to collect my artwork as variant covers, um, that's going to be definitely the campaign for you. I, I I I did a lot of what I think are really really good um, uh, covers uh, for images for that campaign. Uh, that campaign uh, launches at the end of September. So that's why it's like, I, I still, you know, I'm trying to get all this done as uh, far ahead uh, in advance as possible. So uh, oh, let me put, let me put my, my other window back. Let me see. Where's me music? Okay. There we go. Oop, oop. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. Um, cause it, yes, uh, StreamYard only allows me to share one screen at a time pretty much. So, uh, that's how I get the music into the stream once I start playing it. So when I wanted to show you that other page, I had to kick that out of StreamYard in order to get the other, to share the other page. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, we're going to be, so I'm going to be working on, it's like we, we, <laughs> the royal we we're going to be working um on this cover today like i said it is um a fully digital piece over actual physical pencil so i did the blue lines on paper um but i decided um for efficiency's sake and considering that my inking digitally has proven to be 
not any different than inking on paper, except that it's just, like I said, more efficient for me. So I decided to do this last uh, cover completely digital. So um, as you can see, uh, my main uh my, my main line work has already been laid down and now I just have to continue building it up to the final inks. So, um, yeah. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a couple of bumps, switch over my cameras, take it you a know, drink some water, and then we'll get started on uh, inking this piece. So, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, hold on. <laughs> And uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> Only show for independence all around Giving you a platform to spread your word all over town Cause the craze is the place to promote to your fans With the dream of Medina and Sam the Crazy Man Subscribe to our show and never miss an episode It's time to get your man to listen to us on the go Updated every week, we never miss a day Join the squad, come on in, it's time to catch the craze If you are an independent, catch the craze Making moves on your own, catch the craze On your grind in the streets, catch the craze Join the movement, catch the craze! Yeah, George, we did it again. Come on now, now you want to do it. Catch the craze. <laughs> okay oh hello welcome welcome gothic lolita angel from twitch hello welcome nice to see you again <laughs> so um yeah so okay so here's the piece that i'm going to be um starting on so let me get the music started so today's uh, epidemic sound uh soundtrack is again going to be uh, the Bonnie Grace Bonnie Grace uh, playlist. Um, they do most of the, I guess, like the best medieval sounding uh, music that I've come across, and um, yeah, so they they did a lot of music, and uh, that's going to be our soundtrack uh, for today. So uh, you know, so let me make sure. Okay, so it starts off. Okay, some of them starts off really quiet. So, like I said, I want it to be just in the background, just enough in the in the background that it doesn't feel like I'm competing with it. Okay, so like I said, I started this piece 
off on House of Bob, which is the adults uh, only live stream. So of course on that live stream, I was doing the uncensored version. I was inking the underlay, the uncensored underlay of, uh, well, it's the main cover. Actually, if anything is an overlay, it, it's the censored bits. But like I said, it, it's like, can't, you know, can't really do this um, on, on the show. You know, so, um, so yeah, so I've just been really, really taking the opportunity, uh, to, to just learn about as much of, uh, Clip Studio Paint, um, as I can. Cause like I said, it, it's like the, it, it's really, it really has helped me in terms of, um, optimizing uh optimizing my time oh okay what i'm gonna do here so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna put another layer and just fill that with white how do i do that how do i how do i fill that with white because the blue while i'm inking is going to be a little <laughs> oh i gotta be careful with that because the pencils are not censored so <laughs> so um Let's see. So I know the, the fill. Okay, let me just turn that off. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go the long way around and just there. I'm still yeah, because I'm still kind of trying to figure out where. Um, okay, let me make sure that's covered before I do anything else. Um, I don't want to get ax. I don't want to accidentally knock myself uh, off the air. Uh, by having the the wrong uh, by having a, a layer turned off that needs to be on. Um, so so yeah. So I started uh, like I said the the pencils are a blue line that I did by hand and then I scanned it in and then decided that I was going to use uh, Clip Studio to finish it off. And um, I've just been really happy with what I've been getting. Um, and yeah, I'm just really, you know, and I'm just really excited to get more uh, work done uh, because of this, you know, because it's like, um, the, the faster, the, well, you see, I, I think, you know, it's, it's funny because it's like, I don't think that I'm being faster as much as I, I have less anxiety about inking and it's like, and I'm just able to just ink through it. Uh, what I really liked about working on these comic pages for issue eight is, um, you know, like being able to do a whole bunch of things at the same time without feeling like I'm stopping. Like if I, if I, if I didn't like my layouts and I decided I wanted to do a different layout, I could literally just redraw the pencils, you know, like redraw the panel right there. And then once I got the way I wanted, I could just go back to inking without like missing a beat. And, um, and I think in a strange way that saves me a lot of time because it doesn't, it doesn't trigger my proclivity to procrastination when I kind of get stuck. And, uh, I was watching these, uh, videos also on how to use the, uh, the, the 3d models that comes in Clip Studio Paint. Uh, so that that's also another thing. I, I know that that'll be, I have a couple of crowd scenes I have to do. And um, I've been using, you know, like clip art that I've been doing, that I've been finding, you know, just to kind of like get a group of people together and then sketch out what I need and then, you know, ink that. But it's like, oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, Clip Studio has these 3D models I could have done that for. So um, I was watching some videos for that too. So, um, 
you know, and then also it's like, remember, I have these books from Japan, these these how to draw manga books from Japan that has the CDs in it. So I could like that has assets on it. So it's like I can take those assets and and bring them into Clip Studio as well. Um, so yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's just very exciting for me. I know some of it, like, I know a lot of you are like, oh, this is old hat. We know this already. And I go, yeah, but you know, I, I'm just learning about it and I'm just really excited about it. And I'm just going to make, you know, bother everybody <laughs> with it. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, um, oh, I, I forgot to, oh, fuck. I just realized I'm inking on the wrong layer. God damn it. Okay. All right. At least I didn't get too far ahead. Um, just to show you what I did. I thought I was inking on my ink layer. There it is. I inked on the white layer that I wanted to hide. You see? You see? I'm still trying to figure this out. Luckily, I didn't get too far. So, um, so we can fix that so what i'm gonna do is um I'm gonna, it'd just be easier for me to delete that layer um okay so let me delete that layer let me do that again okay let me do that again uh okay so what did i do i did a w i did that okay i chose white fill okay all right, so we're going to select, we're going to deselect. Okay, I know what I forgot I did. I forgot to lock my layer. Because that's what I've been trying, make, trying to make a habit of doing, is to lock the layers I do not want to work on. So, uh, so yeah, so if, if I remember to lock the layer, I wouldn't have been inking on that layer. But, you know, look, we, we had just started. It's okay. Uh, so, okay, I'm back on my ink layer. Uh, okay, that's okay. I'm back on my ink layer and we can now start over. Again. <laughs> you know, it's like I started inking the horn, made the decision to get the white background and then completely forgot to go back to uh, my, my other layer. So, okay, where were we? We were just going to, oh yeah, that's white. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, pretend... <laughs> Pretend that all that other stuff didn't happen. Could have been worse, right? Could have been worse. You know, so... So today, the other thing that uh, I wanted to, to talk about, so, you know, as, as somebody, and I'm sure a lot of you also, you know, know this as well, it's like, you know, we, we have very sedentary lives, you know, when, because it's like the amount of, you know, if, if we're always working at a, at a drawing table or whatnot, you know, we we have very sedentary lives and it's, and it's very important that, uh, we take care of ourselves, um, because of that, you know, it's, um, you know, I started, uh, half marathon training a couple of, you know, several weeks ago, I'm on week five of my program already. So, uh, like, it's kind of like every other day I'm, I'm usually running about like four miles or something for it's just beginning to creep me up to five and six miles um you know because you got to take care of yourself you know like sitting for this much as much as i have really really been enjoying inking and uh working on artwork uh it, it's like there i do have to stop and go do something physical um, in order to make sure, I mean, it's like, look, I, I made this whole big deal about changing my chair, right, from that racer chair uh, that, um, I don't know, it, it really, really, I don't know, messed up my back. I thought it would make a difference, but it really didn't. It actually worsened a couple of things. So I got this regular office chair off of Amazon, and now I'm at the point where I have another pillow behind me. It's like, it's kind of like, you know, like every chair 
starts to create its own issue. Like there is no, like so far it's like, like that, like with that chair, I, I ended up hurting around here, like especially on the back of my neck. But now with this chair, now it's like I'm beginning to like, you know, like have, you know, I really need this lumbar support now, really, you know, except it's a little bit higher. So, um, so yeah, so now it's like every, every, so, so it's like, just goes to show you that you have to kind of like move yourself, you know, you have to move yourself in order to kind of mitigate, uh, these, uh, these issues. Um, so like I said, I started marathon training and whatnot. So, uh, every other day I'm like outside there, there's a park nearby, uh, that I'm always running in and, if it's one thing, so if it's one thing that running is really good for, or any type of exercise, especially when it's outside, is that um, I have a tendency to ruminate on issues and find solutions during these th this this process during this exercise process. Um, it's kind of like how you have your best ideas in the shower, except for me, it's kind of like I usually have my best ideas while I'm running. Um, so now the thing is, though, is that, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be an actual issue that I'm trying to solve. So this is what happened. So the other day um, I'm running, right? Head is empty type of thing. And I'm listening to my music and then the um the thought pops into my head the question pops into my head it's like you know what how does the magic system in the ego raven universe work you know what is you know what are the different classifications you know it's like actually it's kind of like the question that popped in that it's like if you had wizards in the modern world how would the modern world like um regulate that sort of thing you know, it, it's like if you had, you know, because it's like, so which of course had me thinking about like how magic users work um, in my in my story, right? So, um, so I went through this whole rabbit hole of uh, the idea is um, that people usually don't want, you know, when they say that they want things to be realistic, right? Um, you know, like when we talk about realistic fantasy or whatnot, you know, uh, in the end, it's like what people are really talking about is that they're not talking about whether, um, whether a fantasy world is historically accurate, um, you know, in, in comparison to our, like they're historically accurate according to our, um knowledge of history of medieval history or whatnot that this is that and this is you know what the other thing um and i think that what people really mean by that it's not that they want things to be historically they, they want fantasy to be historically accurate but they want the rules of the world to make sense they want the rules of the world um to to actually to you know to 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 create a believable uh environment in this fantasy that you're asking people to to lose themselves in um even though it's like you're you know so you think about like the type of stories that you're writing right and it doesn't matter if it's completely fantastical, whether you're doing fantasy or superheroes or, or you're doing like a shonen thing or, or whatnot, right? Um, you know, the, the point, you know, the, what people are looking for in terms of when they say realism is do the rules of your world make sense? Do the rules that your characters, your environment, your world function under that your characters are reacting to do those rules make sense in the context of your world um you know and you know not necessarily is it realistic to the real world is it realistic 
to your fantasy world, you know, into the, the story that you're telling. And I was really, you know, and, and I kind of like really grasped that concept when I watched The Witcher for the first time. Um, because the, the fantasy elements, I mean, th there were some episodes that they were almost like satire. I, I mean, sometimes I wondered if The Witcher really is more of a satire of Tolkienist fantasy. Um, because like there were just like, like there were just some things that it's like, that were being done in the story that it's like, oh, and, and made that made me go, oh, wait, you could do that? Um, you mean you don't need to like be absolutely, you know, like historically accurate does, again, does it mean literally historically accurate? Um, like there was this one wiki page that I came across where they were talking about um you know like all the different things that appeared um in the witcher as you know canon but how historically they were like hundreds of years apart like like technically it wouldn't have you know like like something is as innocuous as vodka and it, that that's like oh well vodka if this is supposed to be in the 12th century vodka wasn't really created until like 200 years later or something but in the context of the world of the witcher it doesn't matter because its inclusion is is so seamless that um there there's no need to get involved with that type of niddly detail um so i started really incorporating that idea um into my work where it's like if i wanted like if i wanted swedish fish and coffee to be available in my 12th kind of like pseudo 12th century world, I was going to have Swedish fish and coffee. Um, you know, in fact, I have a character in issue two. There's a character who buys Swedish fish at um, at, at the um, at, at the, the the town square market. Someone's selling Swedish fish and he buys a bag of Swedish fish. And it's like, it doesn't matter that Swedish fish is a candy that exists now. It doesn't matter. Um, the fact that I've made that a part of this world, that you can buy Swedish fish, that you can have coffee. Um, uh, you know, and it's, and, um, you know, the idea is that, well, you know, why not? You know, it's like, it's it's such a little thing that it's not like the story hinges on it, you know, but it's just something, you know, fun that I wanted to do. And um, I decided that it's like, yeah, I'm going to have a character who likes Swedish fish and coffee in, in this 12th, pseudo 12th century environment. And um, also, it's like I had to, there was another movie, too, that kind of got me thinking this way, but it wasn't until I saw The Witcher that kind of brought everything together. If you guys remember Heath Ledger's um, A Knight's Tale, where it's, you know, kind of like this whole 12th century story, but with incredibly modern elements. I mean, the, the movie opens with a Queen song. You know, with every, you know, they're, they're watching jousting and, um, you know, and, and the, the, the crowd, a medieval crowd is chanting, we will rock you. Um, but it didn't look unusual. You know, why? Because, the you know, so it's like, because the movie opens up establishing this is the rule of, these are the rules of of this world that you're watching. Yes, it's 12th century, but it's very, very modern. It has very modern aesthetics. Um, and because they automatically 
start off that way. They set your expectations. So when other little things like that start happening, you know, they have, you know, a ballroom scene where it's like the court, you know, a David Bowie song comes up. Um, you don't think it's strange by that point it, because it's like, yeah, of course, you know, this is in context of what they've established. So, so this is where my wizards come in. So this is where my wizards come in. So I'm running, right? And, and I started thinking about, it's like, well, if, if my, if, you know, if part of the longevity of my story is that we do get into the modern age and magic still exists in the modern age um you know uh sorcerers still exist in the modern age how would that you know what would that look like like how would that function i mean would wizards be considered like kind of like a form of weapon you know it's like would using magic would be would would using magic be regulated like like guns you know, like depending on the level of magic user that you are, would you have to be, would you have to have a permit? You know, would you have to register yourself? Would there be um, like, you know, would there be like some kind of organization like the FBI that only keeps an eye on magic users and magical, you know, and magical creatures? You know, it's like, you know, so so that you know so that's kind of like what i started thinking about um when i was running and then it's like yesterday i came across a video by white manga where, where he was explaining the magic rules in his world you know for apple black his comic and you know and i just found it funny how that that yeah, I mean, either the computer is snitching on me, or it was just pure coincidence that that would be the video that would pop up. So I started. So the thing is, it's like so I had to like kind of like go back. Well, it's like okay, how does my world um, right now in the series and in, in my main in in my series Eagle Raven Air the First Unicorn right we have the 15 issues that's done and it's like but how did I establish how magic works you know what what did I do already and and uh when I was looking through it I realized that I had kind of already set the foundation for that world building for that particular question. Um, I just didn't know I was doing it at the time. I just thought that it was something that kind of visually made sense to me, but, um, but um, I didn't quite have an explanation for it yet. So, because I mean, especially like if you're doing like, you know, if you're doing like superhero books or something, right? There's always this thing about how do I not make my character too powerful, right? Because it's like, um, you know, it, it's like, yeah, it's like you can do whatever you want in, you know, in your story, but there still has to be, again, a level of believability in it. If you have a character that's all powerful, then, you know, how do you create conflict with that? How do you, I mean, if they could just, you know, snap their fingers and get rid of all the evil in the world, what's the point of the story? So I'm sure you guys have, have, um, you know, you know about the whole thing about, you know, how to nerf your characters right so that's kind of like what i've been you know kind of thinking about um how do i nerf my characters uh so that you know it, it's like you can't just magic your way out of anything you know it, it's like so what is it okay so it's like if magic exists in this world but at the same time it's not like 
you know, it's not like you have wizards on every corner having a battle. You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, magic exists, but it's not really, you know, like in your face. Now, now here's so here's the thing. It's like okay, how it's like so so what you know it's like so what are like the initial rules? Okay, so so what I thought about was um, you know, like healing magic. So, you know, like, what would stop everybody, you know, so it's like, so, so here you have these, these uh, unicorns that are in this city, right? This is issue two, right? And, um, you know, what's to stop everybody from deciding that it's like, you know what, I, you know, we can have these unicorns heal all the sick or something or this that the other thing we have them here and then there is a scene that kind of alludes to that but um but what kind of stops everybody from you know from going in that direction and the thing that i came up with um that would kind of like stop make people think twice about asking for magical healing, even if they knew someone was a healer, like maybe like there's different levels of healers. Like you have your herbal e healers and your witches and whatnot, or it's like they use, you know, more traditional medicine and plants and that type of thing. And then you have the magical healers, but you know, my whole thing is like, what makes people stop, you know, like, like keep themselves from using them. And the only thing that, and the thing that I thought of is that healing is painful. Like, like, like it's so like, imagine having surgery with no anesthetic. Right. So that was like the first rule that, uh, that, that I came up with, um, when I was writing Eager Raven, it's like, okay, what's the, you know, what's the deal with healing magic? And it's like, it's painful. So people only want to use it in very, very extreme circumstances. Like this is not, it's not a magic healing. Magic is not something you ask for casually. You know, you don't get a scrape and then try to go get some. It's like, no, 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 no. That's kind of the thing that people like, no, I really got to need, I really have to need this to go to uh, a, a sorcerer or, or a healer or whoever, you know, someone with magical healing abilities. And I included, you know, like magical animals, like unicorns as well. That, uh, you know, so... Um, so that was like one way of keeping magic from, from being like a shortcut. Um, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and not getting in the way of, um, of any like storytelling conflict. Um, you know, because again, it's like, you can't magic your way out of stuff that, that was, that was kind of like the thing that I wanted. You can't magic your way out of things. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, and depending on what kind of healing that you get, um, not only is it painful, but also, um, when I wrote my novel, uh, my Eagle Raven novel, I described, um, I, I described kind of like a little healing session in there. And what I also, uh, what I also, you know, did with healing magic to make it more uncomfortable, like uncomfortable enough that people really don't seek it out. Um, so not only is it painful, but depending on the severity of um, what's being healed, um, you actually kind of, the, the mortal body, the, the mortal mind actually can actually link to the immortal magic. Um, and, and it's, you know, kind of like, remember Pacific Rim, there's this whole concept about drifting where it's like the two, the two pilots link mentally and they share each other's memories. 
So it's kind of something like that. But for a mortal, especially, it's incredibly intrusive. And, and that could have um, really adverse reactions um, to the person being healed. Um, like, like they become like temp, like they could become temporarily bonded to the, the to whoever is doing the healing on them. And, you know, and that brings up like a whole other level of discomfort and, you know, and it's like, and depending on how powerful the, the magic user is and how, how bad the wound that's being healed, um, it could it could probably make the situation worse because then it's like you have that mental tie that's not supposed to be there and maybe it could actually cause a psychosis a, a, like a, like a psychic break or something because the mortal can't handle that type of magical intrusion i'm still playing around with the idea But like I said, um, um, oh, I, it, that scene, that scene in Demolition, was it the sex scene? The, you know, it's like the, the, the sex, um, uh, scene, you know, the fake sex scene. Um, cause I, I barely remember Dem Demolition Man, but yeah, it's like, it's something, but it's something like really, really intrusive. Um, and uncomfortable and, um, you know, and, and not something. So, so I had, like I said, it's like, so that's how I kind of nerfed it that way. Right. And, um, and, um, you know, so I, I, you know, so that's, so, so that was like one thing, one angle that I was playing around with in terms of, in terms of magic. Right. So, um, so another thing that I had inadvertently started, um, not really thinking about it, but now it's like that I'm kind of like creating this rule, this magic rule hierarchy. Now it's like, okay, now I have an explanation for these things that I've been drawing in my series for a while, but where it started off as an aesthetic. Now I can, I, it's actually, there, there's actually an explanation for it. So there is this whole thing in, in, uh, in my series where um, magic users have to wear talismans. So there's this, there's this whole thing where Eager Raven goes to her first tournament. And it's like, oh, you're all magic users. You have to wear this. You have to wear uh, what, what, you know, a draining stone. You know, that, that's what I ended up calling these particular talismans. So what it does is that it blocks uh, the magic user it, from using magic. Or at least that's the idea. Um, so, uh, you know, so that I already explained in the book. I, I knew that I, I had I had something, right? But what if... You know, so I was thinking, it's like, okay, so we have the draining stones that's to control magical creatures and mas magical users. Now, what if this was like an all the time thing, right? So in um, my last issue, right? Uh, so in my last issue, I introduced, I well, technically I reintroduced um, Desmond, who's my wizard. Um, he's going to, he, he's one of the main characters. He becomes one of the main characters in the book and he always wears this talisman. And what I started doing again, not realizing it was I was drawing all my wizards with talismans. And so now it's kind of beginning to make sense to me because it's like, okay, what if the talismans was how <laughs> look look i'm not opening the door you guys are just thinking what you're thinking on your own <laughs> you're thinking on your own you know so um you know so what if 
like magic users were required to wear these talismans because that's how they were regulated. You know, you know what I mean? Kind of like I said, it's like, you know, technically wouldn't if you knew magic in the modern world, I, I could see how that would be something that that would like be regulated. Um depending on on what I guess level of spellcaster um uh you are. Um so you know, so I already have like the mage uh <laughs> I have a, uh, I have a varied cover for that. <laughs> so, um, what, you know, so I already have the council of mages. I already have kind of like a regulatory body of wizards that, that are, that are direct, indirect service to the king. They kind of serve as, um, well, they kind of work hand in hand with the church um and and yeah and i think that you know and it's like and i always you know and it's like okay now i kind of have a reason for them what if their whole purpose they're the, like they like i said they're the governing body right so these these talismans that if you are a magic user uh that you have to wear because if they needed to control you they could like that was their way of like okay not only are you kind of announcing that you know from you know like that you're a wizard because you have this talisman um that also in case of an emergency the governing body can control you through that amulet so I, I'm still working out the kinks in, in that because again, it's like, I'm trying, I was, you know, it all started with me trying to figure out how does this relate into the modern, uh, into the modern world. And, and, you know, and here's the thing too, what's funny about this is that this really doesn't affect much in my story. This is it, it, well in, in the way it's written, uh, right now. Um, I just, uh, yeah, it's like, this is just like, I'm just trying to clarify the rules so that if I ever came across another opportunity to write about these things, then, um, you know, then it's, uh, um, you know, I have, I, I already have this this rule set uh, to you know to 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 go by, like so uh, you know oh, it's funny so so this picture you know so so like this picture you know so we have Loki he's he's in his werewolf form, um, and especially at this point he has no control over his shape shifting so he's a shape shifter he's a god he's a shape shifter god but. When he's in the mortal realm, he has no, um, you say, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Cause what, well, it's like, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I'm still, like I said, I'm still kind of thinking about that because the, the whole, am I giving, uh, it's like, say, am I giving away a little bit too much, but you know, I guess for the sake of conversation, I'll, I'll uh, mention it. Um, because you know, like Eager Raven is forced to wear it, but technically it doesn't, it, it doesn't have, her magic is more powerful than the talisman can, can dampen, can dampen. Um, you know, in issue six, there's, um, there's, you know, there's the next, there's, there's an explanation for that. Like it, that's where I explain that's like, even with the talisman, her magic works normally. I mean, it interferes. It interferes with her magic. You know, like it kind of makes her a little sick or something. But she can still use her magic normally, technically. The stone isn't strong enough, right? So um, so technically, with Eager Raven, it doesn't matter if she wears it or doesn't wear it. Because her magic is a lot stronger than what the talisman was created Um to um 
I guess, to control. Although what's funny is that Amadeo, he's really, you know, like he's affected by the talisman. But also he has he has the whole thing and that he's that that he has the pole that's also wrecking havoc with him. He's far away from Edenron, which which controls his magic. So he's kind of already in a weakened state magically. So the talisman has more of an effect on him, but it doesn't affect Eager Raven. Now, now, like you said, what stops the person from from removing it? So that was also kind of like another thing that that i was thinking about that it's like maybe it's more of just like a visual cue the stone is like a more of a visual cue rather than like they can control you through it but yeah it's like you could not wear it but the the regulatory council knows you still exist like that's kind of like what i'm what i'm trying to figure out like think of like the fbi right and they kind of know, you know, like, um, oh, let's see. Okay, let me see. An interesting concept from God of War Ragnarok game was that Odin had his hanging rope enchanted that sink the runes around his neck. Whoever controls the rope by tightening it chokes Odin. Oh, okay. There you go. Um, that's, I mean, it's like, yeah, that that's not what I would, I, I mean, God. Yeah, it's like, because, yeah, because the, the idea would like, like, it's kind of like, yeah, like there would be a certain level of control, which is also the reason why the penalty for not having the stone around your neck. Like, I, again, I mentioned it, I think like in issue five, um, where they tell Eager Raven and the crew that the penalty for not wearing the stone is incarceration. So, you know, like we know you exist so I, I guess like they can remove it, but if they're caught without the stone, they can be incarcerated. So I guess that would be kind of, you know, well, <laughs> you know, and then that kind of makes it worse because uh, then you're under, then you're under the thumb of the actual mage council, you know, and, and it's like, um, you know, they, what, you know, and then it's like they can, you know, they can work directly on you, I guess, if they had to. Um, so, you know, so, oh, so what I was about to say is that, you know, when I introduced Loki and Eros into the canon, right? So the first thing that I did is like, again, it's like, these are two gods, right? How do I nerf the gods? Because it's like they're in the mortal realm. So, um, so again, it's like I made up this complete, I actually did a doodle on this where I made up a complete set of rules about, you know, the gods in the mortal realm, where it's like when already being in the mortal realm, they're nerfed already. They, they, they don't have complete access to their powers, whatever those powers may be, right? Whatever makes them God powers. I, I don't know. But, um, um, they're they're nerfed already in the mortal realm so when eros and and loki end up in the mortal realm they're not all powerful they they can't it's like they would have to return to their respective realms god realms to be gods but here they're not um they're just i, I guess it's like they're they're the equivalent of like being above really powerful wizards um but, you know, but also at the same time, they're not announcing that they're gods either um, when they're in the mortal realm. You know, it's just like, like I said, so like, so here, you know, Werewolf Loki, uh, when we first meet him, he has no real control over his powers. Um, so actually him being a werewolf is actually kind of like a more weakened state for him because it's not his main body it's not his yeah it, it's not his body technically um you know he was banished from asgard you know he's in the mortal realm and he's kind of trapped in these in, in his in this very limited um he, he's he's not even tra he's trapped in not even his own body um so um 
you know, again, it's like trying to nerf. How do you nerf a god? <laughs> you know? Um and um right so for so for the gods so i came up with these rules that when they're in the mortal realm like one they don't have access they don't have full access to their powers to begin with right and depending on how and it's like and depending on on whether they're near they're they're more powerful when they're on sacred ground that's consecrated to them but if they're not on consecrated ground, they're in an even more weakened state. So, um, you know, so they can't travel freely. So the further, like, like to take Loki as an example, the, the, uh, oh, um, oh, you're sitting, I say, it's like you're sitting with the magical Fernie paradox by introducing a great filter. Oh, interesting. I got to look that up. The the Ferny paradox. Well, yeah, I mean, a great filter. Yeah, I mean, because like I said, I don't want anybody to magic their way out of anything. Um So, um So, the farther they are from consecrated ground, the weaker they are. And especially with like you know, and in and, and the way I think of it, the further they are from consecrated ground, the less they're able to hold on to their more human shapes. So the further they are, so it's like, so, you know, so here's Loki in his werewolf form. If he was far enough away, if he was, wasn't even near consecrated ground at all, he, he could only be, a, he would only be a snake. You know, it's like, like that would be his, you know, his, it's, that's his sacred animal, but it's also kind of like his weakest body. So, um, so it's the same thing with Eros. If he was on non-consecrated ground, he would be, he would just turn into a hare and, you know, he would just be a rabbit, uh, pretty much. Um, the, oh, um, oh, it's about alien communication. Oh, okay. Um. I'll still gotta look that up though, so I have some context. Um, so, so yeah, so it's it's um, so yeah, it's so it's like you know, like like creating these weaker states that they're in, um, and uh, you know, so. You know, so the thing, you know, so the thing is, it's like also here was another thing that I had to come that, that I had to kind of figure out is um, so the only way that because this is where Eagle Raven comes in, the only the only real way Loki and Eros can be in the mortal realm really as freely as they are is through her. So what it is is that they're both well, she's bonded to them, but but what what is really happening is that their magic they're all their all three of their magic is intertwined with her and i have to give credit to jose for actually it was a, it was a throwaway line that that we were just talking about because i was trying to figure something out and i mentioned the thing about it's like yeah it's like they're bonded to her you know, so it's like that, that, so their magic's like they're using her magic in order to supplement theirs, um, to be in the mortal realm in a more useful state. Um, but the, you know, but the thing is though, it's like the only reason it works is because Eager Raven is strong enough magically to be able to handle God magic. Um, uh, there's there in, in my novel, there's a part where Loki explains that it's like, um, there have been human mortal emissaries before, but they never lasted long because they all went mad because to be an emissary is to allow a God to, to, you know, it, to, to, to share that magic, to, to entwine your magic with a God, but there's no mortal that can handle it. But, Eagle Raven's not mortal. So technically, you know, so, so they're entwined her, their magic is entwined with hers. But here's the thing though. 
I didn't want this to be something that any God could just casually do. Um, one, it has to be done with permission. Um, because what they're actually doing, and again, like I said, I have to thank Jose for this idea, is that what they're actually doing is possessing each other. Um, and I was kind of playing around more with that concept where, where if they wanted, I mean, if Loki or Eros wanted to be real dicks about it, they could literally force Eagle Raven to do whatever they want by completely possessing her. But they don't do that because the reverse is true, too. That if she wanted, she could she could take from their magic and actually manifest manifest as them. Um, she could technically do the same thing to them. So it's not something that not even the gods want to play around with. Um, that's why it's like it's a really big deal um, when a god allows another god to to bond with them like that. Um, something like that. Yeah, it's like they're sharing the same mana pool. Yes, yeah, something like that. Um, because that's that's especially um, so it's like, but, you know, the, the catch is, is that they always need if they wanted to, like, really stay in the mortal realm, they always need Eagle Raven with her because that's the rule. As long as they have an emissary, they're technically free to go anywhere and to do anything as long as they have an emissary. If they don't have an emissary, they they can't last long here or at least not in any full form. Um I mean, Eros especially doesn't like being in the mortal realm. He's only in the mortal, he only spends as much time in the mortal realm as he needs to. Um, and that's only because of these two assholes. <laughs> it's only because of Eager Raven and Loki that it's like, you know, even though Eros is Eager Raven's first patron god, you know, it, it's like, it's when Loki gets involved that's like, fuck, I got to spend more time in the mortal realm. <laughs> you know? because they're both bonded to Eros and there's a story that I'm percolating um, where that becomes an issue or at least that becomes an issue um, with Ero on Eros's side um, uh, yeah that, that becomes an issue because yeah like I said it's a big deal for because it's dangerous it's, you know, because it's like you can have, you know, the gun, it's like you're, you're literally taught, I mean, they, they can possess each other and it's not a good idea for gods to do that, to be able to do that. Um, so again, how, you know, it's like, okay, so how do I make this uncomfortable for everybody? Yes, that's, I, I think so. He is, he is the straight, he is the straight man by not being completely straight. <laughs> yes. It, well, the three of them are not completely straight anyway. <laughs> yeah, but yes, Eros is the straight man of the group. He's kind of like the one he kind of has to like, he's the guy who has to keep everyone's shit together. You know, because Loki can't get his shit together. <laughs> and Ika Raven's like, what the fuck? I wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> you, know? you know, but... But the thing is, though, also part of it, too, the thing that I haven't figured out yet, although I had made a comment on one of their bios, is that the reason those two are involved with Eagle Raven is that they're both being punished by taking care of her. So it's just figuring out what they're being punished for. <laughs> You know, that they have to, it's like, okay, you two assholes did something. So now we're going to punish you by forcing you to take care of the emissary. Um, so again, that's, that's another way I'm kind of like trying, you know, like, like figuring out, it's like, you know, how, you know, what, what's, what are the rules of this dynamic? So it um, would help if I continue inking as I'm talking, right? Um so, um, you know, so again, like going back to, to magic users, um, you know, in, in my world, 
So now the other question that I was asking myself is that what would be the different classes of magic users that depending on, you know, like, okay, so you have this regulatory body, right? Right. So, so I could imagine them like different types of different types of wizards, depending on, I guess, what you specialized in would, would be regulated differently. You know, war mages, um, battle mages would be regulated differently than um, than maybe like elemental mages, depending on what they did. You know, because it's like you're not going to treat a guy, you know, a wizard who can do fireballs, you know, who, who can, you know, you know, um, do projectile you know, magic. You're not going to treat them the same way as someone who can like, they can grow plants faster. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, they can encourage trees to grow and shit. You know, it's like you're not gonna treat them the same way. So um so I was like, okay, so it's like I have to figure out a classification as to like like maybe it's like you could be considered like you're like Almost like, you know what it is? It's like, I go, oh my God. It's like, I gotta, I gotta probably find some Dungeons and Dragons manuals or something and figure this out because it's like, probably like if you're like a level one, like, like a, a class one, you know, cause, oh, if we classify them like drugs, let's look at it like this. Can we classify wizards like drugs where you have a class one wizard? right maybe they do like innocuous shit you know like I, I don't know they could do like levitation or whatnot it's like you know but they're kind of like um they're harmless but the fact that they're still magic users kind of still makes them a little sus um and then like maybe you have like class five wizards where it's like they're they're fucking dangerous and they have to be reined in somehow you know it's like where it's like you know like maybe it's like if you if it turns out that you're like a class five, like you're a battle mage like it could be like you're immediately con constrict con constricted concrete no oh you're you're forced into the military <laughs> conscripted conscripted You know, um, that that maybe it's like, you know, if you're a battle mage, you're um, you're immediately you're you're conscripted into the military or at least, you know, the the wizards, um, you know, pretty much you become a direct, you know, it's like you're it's like, you know, you're, you're yeah, you're you're military at that point. You're automatically military. Because now it's like you're immediate, you're put into the service of the king. Um, you know, it's like your job, you know, if you have this level of magic, you're required to protect the realm, you know, type of thing. Um, you know, um, so yeah, so that's kind of like, okay, what would be the levels? And then it's like, like another thing that I, that I was thinking of is like, okay, you have like, the, like, how do they keep track of everybody? Like, even if you're not wearing the talisman, would the mage council know, still know who you are? So it's like, you know, so I kind of like imagine like, kind of like this, this table that works like, kind of like it can, I don't know, like they, they're able to know who is a magic user, like maybe from birth, you know, where it's like they have this table that shows all the magic users in the realm. And then every time one is born, maybe, maybe like something lights up and they know who they are. Um, um, there was kind of uh, something similar that happened in The Witcher, if I understood it correctly, where um, if if I remember correctly, how Yennefer ended up with the witches, uh, that 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 they kind of knew, like her her powers, Yennefer's powers started manifesting, and a witch came by and offered to, you know, and bought her off of her father because it's like, no, we know who you are and 
we're going to bring you back so that we could train you properly. So, um, you know, some kind of thinking that maybe that would, um, um, that maybe it would be something like that, um, that if you're a born magic user, um, that's how they kind of like hook you up as apprentices very quickly. Um, I guess, depending how it starts manifesting, um, you know, or, or maybe, yeah, or maybe it's like once your magic starts manifesting, that's when you appear on the table. Um, when you become an X-Men, <laughs> you know, pretty much. Um, You know, yeah, it's like, um, let me see. Uh, let's see. Using a familiar proxy, a high-level mage can scry the information remotely and confirm the person's a mage, or they can trace magical residue. Yeah, yeah, kind of, you know, kind of like uh, really chlorians without, without it being stupid, <laughs> without it being that incredibly stupid. Um Oh my God. It's like, how do you like, like the force we were, isn't it funny how we were all willing to accept the like, like the concept of the force almost without question, but midichlorians was a step too far. Like, like you see, and that's the thing too. It's like, how do I, you know, it's like, how do I explain it without going that step too far that it just becomes ridiculous? Now you're overthinking it, you know? but uh, yes, yeah, something like that, like, like they could like either trace magical residue or, you know, like, would they, you know, and, and so here's the thing though, it's like, they know, um, like could so now, now, so, so here's the thing is that, so Eagle Raven doesn't appear on the table as magical as she is because what I is because what I'm it's like what I'm probably you know thinking right now as we speak is that everything that the mages know about magic is all based on mortal magic. Immortal magic is something different. It's out. It's kind of like out of their pay grade pretty much, or, or even beyond their, beyond their knowledge base. Like, so they know mortal magic humans, you know, you know, not necessarily, I mean, I'm pretty sure that there's, you know, animal people who could do wizardry too, or at least I have, you know, that that's, you know, um, but mortal magic mortals, like, like that's their education base is, uh, is mortal magic users um, because immortal, immortal magic, God magic, divine magic is um, maybe it's too unstable for them to really know what it is to, for them to really know how to control it. That's, and in the end, it's like, that's why the talisman doesn't really work on Eager Raven because her magic is not mortal magic. Um, you know, just like Rillian's magic is not mortal magic either. Uh, <laughs> well, that's well, that's technically what Eros, Loki, and Eva Raven do. That's the emissary. She's the password that they're sharing. <laughs> that's that's kind of that. Um, that's why it's not encouraged. That's why nobody wants to do that because you don't share your passwords. It's like, oh, uh, I have one of your comics for a comic and show. It's, oh, very nice. Oh, thank you. Which uh, which comics was it? Tall Tales. Um, it, did you find it in? Uh, <laughs> did you find it in a in a in a in a dollar bin or something? Or was someone selling uh, the books? I look. It's like if you found it in a dollar bin, that's fine too. I'm sure we have we have hundreds of thousands of our books out there since '92. Uh, actually, actually, it's more thousands. It's more thousands. Um, 
since 92 that we've been finding in dollar bins for all these years. And it's just always funny. Um, spells and chill. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like I said, yeah, so that's technically, so Eager Raven's the password that that both Eros and Loki are sharing. But like I said, it's like you don't do that. Um, you know, you, you, you know, you don't share that magic because it's dangerous. It opens, technically, it's a very dangerous thing for them. Because the fact that they trust each other so much is probably the only reason they can do that. You know, because because when they meet when they meet Ishtar, she does she refuses to bond. She refuses to bond. She doesn't bond with any of them. It's like, no, fuck that shit. I'm not <laughs> it's like the last thing she needs, you know. Um yeah, she she's she so she doesn't bond with any and most gods don't. Um it, it, it like I said, it's just them. Um it's like, oh yeah, what what the the dollar bins? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, look, we've been printing, we've been printing books since ninety two, and it's like, yeah, it's like we have a friend who he when he goes to like comic book stores and whatnot and uh, conventions, when he sees dollar bins, he um, you know, he goes through them, and if he finds any of our books, he buys them. And and he has a whole stack of our books that he's found in dollar bins. I, I mean, it's just so that's why it's like, you know, if you found our stuff in dollar bins, it's like it, it's like cool. The fact that the books are still floating around after all these years. Which ones did you find? Um, was it the, one of the more recent ones from Kickstarter or did you find like one of the older ones from back in the day? I'm curious. I'm curious as to which one you found. Um, let's see. Um, let, let me see. Oh, this damn innuendo cleared everything up now. We should keep using and build on that euphemism. Which one, Jake? Which one? The password? Because <laughs> that, honestly, that's a good one. I, uh, that's exactly, I mean, it was funny. I never, I didn't think of it like that, but you mentioning like that is exactly, um, it, that, that's exactly what's going on. You know, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, so that's why that's, yeah. Um, and, uh, let, let's see. So, um, so, so yeah, what, so where, where, where did we leave off, um, magical levels? Um, oh, so, right. So immortal, <laughs> Imagine not paying premium, not paying for premium magic. It's true. It's true. It's true. That's why. I, and I think that that's why that becomes a source of conflict. I, I, I there, like I said, there's a story I'm percolating where that becomes a source of conflict. Um, um, and, uh, um, yeah, so, um, or, or, yeah, so it's like, uh, yeah, so immortal magic. Yeah, so immortal magic is not, like, the Mage Council can't regulate it because it's that's more wild magic. Um, so they have, like, they would literally have to have, like, a literal god working for them in order to be able to control immortal magic, and that's not happening. So that that's not even like that's how that's how far they need to be in order to control uh, in in order to keep track of and uh, um, and control immortal magic, which uh, <laughs> just uh, just for marketing sake, immortal magic is here on is here on soul with a K at the end for the exclusivity. <laughs> Love it. I love it. Um, so, so yeah, so that's why it's like, they, they don't know, like, like they, all, all they could do is just give Eagle Raven a talisman because they don't know, like they obviously think that she's a magic. They can only assume she's magical, not by how much, um, and hope that the talisman that they force her to wear is enough 
kind of control it, even though technically it doesn't. Um, but um, you know, it, it's yeah. So it's like it's yeah. So it's just like trying. Um, you know, to figure out all these rules and yeah. And there's just coming a point where it's like, you know, maybe I need to talk to somebody who's like a dungeon master or something from maybe I should, you know, cause Jose used to, used to dungeon master for, he used to be a dungeon master for like years. So I might have to talk to him about, <laughs> you know, yeah. Buy now and get a free draining stone. Yeah. But I, I think that that's kind of part of it, right? That it's like they recognize you as um, they recognize you as um, a magic user, and right off the bat, they have to have control over that because it's like, well, we don't, you know, it's like a, a wizard can easily become a weapon of mass destruction, essentially, depending on. I mean, just the chaos that that even just a low level magic user can do. Um. So, you know, so I can, so yeah, so I can see um, how, you know, how that becomes important for them to regulate. Uh, they know who the magic users are. Um, they know how to kind of control them, you know, how to keep them from really causing chaos in society. Um, you know, it's... Um, Yeah, and it's like, oh, and when, and especially when we transition to modern, like, uh, like to the modern immortals, you know, when Eager Raven and Loki, and you know, like they're they're in modern times now. Um, <laughs> well, there you go, free puns, free puns for everybody. <laughs> um. All the all the puns you can flip tables for. Um, puns never go out of style. Um, you know, so when, you know, so it's like, okay, so, you know, how would this transition to the modern world? So if we have this regulatory body, right? There's, you know, so it's like, you know, so yeah, so you would have kind of like the magical equivalent of the FBI, and then you'd have probably smaller departments in local, um, you know, um, police departments or something that would specifically deal with magical creatures or like lower level um uh, wizards, you know, or, or regulate lower, lower level. <laughs> Be wary, <laughs> wizards, wrath. Um, um, and uh, you know, because I, I kind, because it's like, um, you know, like episodes, episodes, episodes ago, I had come up, you know, I had like back in my furry days, I had a furry version of the X-Files. Um, and it was like a fox and a cat. And, you know, it's like they were, you know, it's like Fox, Mueller, Dana, Silky, and they ran, you know, and it's just supposed to be a furry parody of the X-Files. But um, I thought it would be funny to kind of like, well, what if they were part of the immortal, the immortal mortals, immortal modern immortals timeline you know where it's like they run an underfunded department you know it, you know that they specialize in keeping tabs on magical creatures right because you kind of fit because i kind of figure that like higher level wizards and magic higher level magical creatures would be handled by the fbi you know kind of like you know local departments handle smaller cases and then when you get to like fucking jeffrey dahmer then the fbi gets involved you know type of thing you know um so i'm kind of imagining that for magic users again the whole classes if you're like a class one like maybe you know it's like so anything under class one 
which is like you know petty wizards or something we can even call them that petty wizards or something um petty sorcerers you know that's that's a local jurisdiction thing um am i yeah oh right yeah kind of i mean i thought that they were like i kind of understood cabin and no they they were they weren't manufacturing they were that's how they controlled everything right that's why they needed the, the virgin sacrifice at the end uh, they needed everything to fit a pattern to appease the gods type of thing if i remember the movie correctly i mean yeah so so imagine that yeah it's like so we have but not as ridiculous it's like um you know so yeah so you would have like local jurisdictions for petty wizards and then maybe like from class one you know like treating them like drugs you know class one and up then that's a federal thing right so it's like so in the modern world so if you have this setup where would loki and and eagle raven fit again it's like i don't think that um I don't think that even in all these years, um, I don't see like wild magic, immortal magic still being like, like probably there's more awareness of immortal magic, but they, it's still not something that they can control. So I can imagine like Loki and Eager Raven having to be registered as like maybe like lower class mages you know, just so that they're in the system, but they're still not something that can be really regulated or controlled. Um, you know, um, you know, and also it's like by that point too, in the future, I kind of imagine like a lot of the immortals that still exist in the general population would kind of, of have gotten like gotten together and formed some kind of secret society. Um, uh, you know, kind of like, like kind of like a secret society to protect themselves kind of from this regulation. You know, I'm kind of like visualizing something like that too. Um, you know, kind of like they figure we have to regulate ourselves or else it's going to force the mortals to try to do something and they don't know how to handle that. Um, well, you see, I wouldn't. Oh, hey, Joe. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't see a war between magic and science. I would actually what I see in in my world. Um, <laughs> Jake is on a roll. Focus, focus. You're gonna kill me. <laughs> um, um, so, so yeah, that's kind of right. So, so I could imagine them doing like some kind of secret society where they know they have to regulate themselves, so, kind of like, kind of like in Constantine. I forgot. You know, that, that club, that Constantine, when he has to read the tarot cards, he has to, like, predict the card to be able to get in. Um, uh, kind of like that, where it's like they know that they have to, like, really, you know, to have this, uh, this organization in order to continue surviving. Or else, like I said, the mortals try to get involved and it's not really a good idea. Um, you know, that's why, um, it kind of like, I have this story where it kind of gets a little complicated for everybody. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. You know, like kind of like, the, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like, there's a lot of these similar themes. Um, but it, you see, but the funny thing is, is like the more I think about it, the more, even though like, yeah, there, there are other iterations of these themes, but it, I would think it, it would have to be Patrick. It sounds like a highly regulated guild. I would think it has to be. 
because like I said, it's like there's already this regulation in like for mortal magic. And the last thing they want, the, the immortals want is for mortals to think that they can regulate immortal magic too. Um, you know, like how do you, you know, it's like, how do you regulate gods? You know, I mean, you don't, you know, you don't do that. Um, and I kind of like, kind of see, like, again, a, another story that I'm percolating in the mortal, in the modern immortals thing, uh, storyline where, um, uh, vampires become a problem because vampires are like, the, they're immortal. They're the immortal undead and they try to, to come back into the mortal realm and it's up to the immortals. And so the immortals team up with more mortal sorcerers to, to fight off this menace. I'm still working on it. It's very, very rough. Um, um, no, at, well, okay. Oh, right, right. The, the thought that I was, okay. So Joe is saying, I'm still stuck with magic versus science. Magic typically doesn't affect the artificial since it's, it sources nature. I see a war between magic and science as people turn towards science. Actually, um, what I see is magic being incorporated into science. Um, I, I'm kind of, I, I kind of play, it, it's kind of a play on the, um, I guess I, I forgot who said it, but science done correctly looks like magic. Um, it, I'm very paraphrasing it. So that's kind of what I see, uh, in, at least in my world, in, in my environment, in my mythology here, where eventually like the more science becomes prevalent, magic starts to get incorporated into that. So they're actually kind of working together. Um, I don't like, I don't see like, uh, um, oh, well, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's, um, I, I was over, I overheard a lot of it. Jose watched it and I was overhearing a lot of, yeah. So it's, it's kind of like that where it's like that, that would be like, you know, like they would be working together. Um, because like I said, Matt, especially, you know, magic is not absolute, you know, magic is not like, oh, you can't just magic a cure for cancer type of thing. You know, like magic can just like, yeah, like the magic itself has certain rules it has to follow. Um, because again, I don't want people to just magic their way out of problems. So that's why I have to kind of nerf it. Um, you know, um, Let's see. Oh, uh, let's see here. He says magic police would be practitioners of science and alchemy. Well, yeah, exactly. They would write. So it's like um, um, magic users. Oh, so part of modern immortals, another scene that, that I, that I'm thinking of, right. The kind of like putting it all together. Now, remember like in the modern world, um, in the modern world, um, Eager Raven is a, she's, she's kind of like a founding dean of the school that, that Edenron turns into. Um, Edenron turns into a school of magic and Eager Raven becomes, is kind of like the forever dean of that school because it's like she ends up running kind of like well by this point she becomes more of a figurehead she you know it's like but it's like it, it, the whole thing is that 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 she just goes from being a warrior to to a paperwork pusher type of thing like that's kind of like the theme that i was going with this modern immortals storyline where it's like holy like I, like there's a scene where i kind of imagine her complaining to loki it's like you know, I remember when we were warriors, you know, and, and it's like, and Loki tells her, it's like, look, he's been around for like 5,000 years. Like, what does he care? And he's like going, yeah, we're still warriors. It's just our battles are different now. Um, and um, and it's like, and it kind of like goes into this thing where it's like uh, the, these, the, these vampire gangs are trying to like start literally a war between immortals and mortals 
um um and uh well right oh uh, well it, it's funny that you mentioned rune because rune magic right because that's it that's that's something that i touch upon in the novel where it's like you can know rune magic without being a sorcerer you know it's like as long as you know how to write you know it's like as long as you write the you know do the right combination of runes you can actually activate spells but it doesn't make you a sorcerer because it's like it's the runes that are magic not the person um so yeah that's something that i do um yeah that i do that i do touch upon um in the novel still trying to work this out um so well oh yeah so so the book right so like i, I have this whole thing with vampire gangs trying to start a gang war with, between the immortals and the mortal realm and and the immortals have to get together with the mortals in order to fight them and and there's this whole thing where Loki and Eager Raven get arrested because they're they're on a heist. They get caught in a high speed chase trying to fight these vampire, a fight a vampire gang, and then they end up with 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 Fox Mueller and Dana Silky, you know, with this department. And it's like, okay, you're probation. They're, you know, Eager Raven and Loki are put on probation. It's like, okay, you have to work with this department. Um, you have to work with this department. And then there's kind of like this scene in my head that I have to try to make sense somehow where it's like so that for some reason they have to go to Las Vegas <laughs> and they they have to use the cover of, um, of, of a student music tournament to, to go to end up in Las Vegas where they can meet up with their local department of you know but it's but the head their representatives in las vegas is coyote and coco Pelli. um so coyote being a native american trickster god right so you know so it's like so they have so so this department happens to have a trickster god and coco Pelli um with them you know you know working for them and they're you know and they're investigating you know a, a rash of vampire gang activity in vegas and eager raven and loki have to get involved and it's a whole thing and i'm trying to make this you know and the, this story i'm trying to get it to make sense <laughs> but um but you know that the thing is though but it all boils down to what are the rules of um you know of the magic in my world so that i know how these stories can come together um as ridiculous as they sound right now um so uh, you know so it, you know it it's just um yeah it, it's just yeah it, it's like just just, 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 there's a lot rattling up over here, and it's like, look, a lot of this um, world building. This is the thing, funny thing with world building, is that a lot of this never makes it onto paper. That's the funny thing about it, right? That um, you know, it's like I'm putting in a lot of this thought, um, and a lot of you know and yeah and it's like a lot of great ideas were hashed out thank you jake <laughs> thank you joe <laughs> you know oh that reminds me hold on that reminds me i don't know who it is but it probably is for hogwa guys i asked my friend joe i asked my friend jake they said it was for hogwa guys and that's exactly what happened right i asked for friend joe asked for friend jake and you said it was you know read the dungeon the dragon's manual <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that, so that's the funny thing about world building is that a lot of people think that, oh, you have to have a complete world. You, you have to have that first before you even write your story. And actually it's just the opposite. I think you have to have just enough to start your, you know, to do your story and then you can build on it as your story builds. 
Um, because a lot of people, I see it all the time, you know, they use the excuse of, oh, I'm still story building before they even write one paragraph. And um, they never write their book because they never finish storytelling. They never finish world building. And it's, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, you see, you see, I haven't played the clip in a while. Um, let's see. It's like, I just see this as magic users being happier where things were not explained through science and alchemy. Again, approaching from a sci-fi POV. Well, you see, you see, and here's the thing too. That's how I explain a lot of the magic in my world it's like literally i have people go that's not how it works and leave it at that you know it, it's it's like there there comes a point where you know what i'm not gonna sit here and and literally create a DD manual i'm not doing that you know there are just some things when it comes to magic my answer to it is it's like look that's just the way it's always been um that's not how it works, or that's just how it works. I can't explain it, and that's it. Move on. Um, I think that that part of the danger of world building is trying, well, is that you don't want to get caught up in minutia, in too much minutia. It's one thing if it's like, if it is something that becomes important to the story that you need to kind of figure, hash something out. But, um, you know, most of the time, though, it, it's like, look, you literally can say um, uh, this is just how it's always been and move on. You know, there, there comes a point where it, it's like, you know what, do you really need to know how a spell actually works? It's like, no, it's a spell. It's it, it's like, you know what, there are just some things that if I am... If I am doing my storytelling correctly, if I am doing my world building correctly, I should be able to say shit like that without people finding it strange. I, I mean, I think about when I read Dune for the first time and talk about a guy who doesn't explain shit. Frank Herbert does not get into detail, really. He doesn't get into detail about how the spice works bio biologically. You know, he just says, this is what happens when people take spice. If you take enough spice, you become a navigator. You know, it's like, it, it, you know, it's like, you know, okay, your eyes turn blue, you know, but, but he doesn't explain what actually physiologically happens in the eyes to turn them blue. That, you know, I, I mean, it's like the way no ships work, the way the uh, aloxyl, the, the aloxyl tanks work. I mean, it's like, it's like you kind of, you know, once he explains what an aloxyl tank is like, oh, okay, that's gross. And you just leave it at that. You know, you don't have to go into complete minutia uh, with it. I, I mean, yeah, I, I agree, Patrick. I mean, this is why we call magic magic. Um. Yeah, it's like I actively fight scope creep. It's the daily boss fight whenever doing pre-production. It is because, again, you don't want to get caught up in minutia. You know, you want to get enough information that it adds that verisimilitude to your world. That's the reality that people are looking for when they when they're reading something. They don't want when people say they want realism, they don't want reality. That's why, you know, there's all this pushback against so-called political comics, because it's like, that's not the reality we want. You know, it's like, and also for the fact that they're usually ham-fisted about it. And it's like, that that's not what they want either. They want, um, they want reality that actually fits in that world. You know, that actually makes sense in that world. I mean, it really, I, I know it doesn't look like I did much, but uh, you can kind of see where it's it's building up. The, the inking is is building up over here. But, you know, hey, um, you know, uh, let, let's see. Uh, the the Again, the fight of believing and accepting the nature and existence of things, magic, as opposed to understanding the form and application of things, science. And, and like I said, I in, in my world, I like to see that the both end up working with each other. Um, 
you know, so it's like, yeah, it's if, if there's any war um, in my story, it's it's immortals versus mortals. And that's already established in the series already is that mortals are more than happy to work with magic users. You know, they you know, it's just that immortals, they don't they don't trust because they can't control that magic. Um, I see it's called believability because it requires lies to sell the world. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> well, but that's, yeah, that, but that's exactly, uh, you know, what it is, you know? So it's like, yeah. So every time I go running, this is what ends up going through my head. You know, the endorphins releases this, Hey, we got to figure out some world building here while you're exercising. It's like, fine, we'll do that. You know? So, um, so yes. Oh my goodness. Uh, I mean, so I, I think we hashed out a lot. I think we hashed out a lot. I, I really do like what we came up with. Um, you know, it, it's like, uh, it's, I, I'm glad that what I'm talking about, cause you know, what, uh, you know, like, like obviously, so so I at least I'm a little confident that what I'm thinking about makes sense, as weird as it sounds. Um, because like I said, I'm still like hashing a lot of this out uh, because it kind of becomes more important to certain stories. Like I said, I don't want to get wrapped up in minutia, but I just want enough so that you know, the stories make sense when I finally put them together. Um, uh, oh, oh, and, and it's a fun, and the thing about Joe mentioning alchemy, because um, in, in another novel that I'm still putting together, I'm still outlining, um, uh, The Heart of the Unicorn, it's literally a story about immortals versus alchemists. So it, it's like, so there's these two alchemists that turn out to be serial killers, and um you know so it's like yeah that's it's so so yeah so that's so there there's going to be you know that conflict between magic users and alchemists and i already have this thing going back to the rune magic um you know going back to rune magic is that um you know that alchemists are trying to use magic but they're not magic users and depending on, and it's the symbols that hold the power, not the person using it, you know, but they have to scroll them correctly in order to activate them, whatever it is that they're trying to do. So there's a line where, um, there, there's a line that I have in one of my, kind of like beta paragraphs you know that where loki's explaining it's like look that cretin back there he's using he's using malevolent magic which is the alchemy his you know the way he describes alchemy it's like he's not a magic user but he knows just enough to be dangerous so there is there is going to be those distinctions um you know the idea of non-magic using mortals being able to control uh magical symbols to create magic but not because they have magic but because they can write it correctly um to activate it so that's yeah again it's like that's something um that uh i would uh have I, i'm still sorting out um Oh, uh, <laughs> again, something that popped up when I was running, right? Because I was thinking about that, why magic in modern terms are considered tricks and not pure magic. People look for explanation in things. So using Las Vegas as the angle for the story that I have, that I'm, again, percolating. So I kind of thought about that for a split second. It's like, would someone like David Copperfield exist? And they go like, of course. You know, because he's he's doing sleight of hand. And what I kind of imagine is that actual magic users are not allowed to that like like there wouldn't be a David Copperfield who's an actual magician, you know, like in the magical sense, in the fantasy magical sense. Um 
And what I kind of see is that that um, people like like the most popular shows in Vegas are still people like David Copperfield because they can explain the magic. You know, it's kind of like if Penn and Teller was, you know, like legitimized pretty much. Like, it's like, no, it's like the fact that like, it's kind of like taking, you know, like right now it's like, like magicians, the magician's code, never tell your secrets. And, but here in this, when you're in a world of actual magic, the most popular magicians are the ones who can explain their magic. Like, like people prefer to see fake magic than actually encounter real magic because that's a completely different animal. It's a, it's like the difference between being on a roller coaster and actually being in a 40 car pileup, you know, cause that's kind of like how it feels like, you know, a roller coaster is a, is a very controlled environment that simulates a dangerous situation, but you're never in danger. While an actual 40 car pileup is a dangerous situation that could kill you. So, um, so I kind of, you know, so it's like, I'm kind of like seeing it like, you know, like I, I'm kind of like seeing it's like, oh, that would be kind of like an irony of it where it's like people who could do sleight of hand and actually show, explain their tricks would actually be more popular than people who could actually wield magic. I mean, it's just like stupid shit like that, you know, that, uh, that, that I'm thinking about, you know, and like I said, most of this stuff doesn't even, you know, it's like, it's literally information that might not even get explained on paper, but I have it in my world building, you know, catalog so that if I do have, you know, it's like, cause, cause things are easier to create when you have rules. So, um you know so that's you know um so here we are it's already like 12 after i mean it's like look when it comes to like 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 this 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 topic i could just keep going on um i'm actually glad i like i, said, I for a little bit i thought that um i wasn't going to do the stream but i'm actually really glad that i did because like i said i, I think we hashed out some good things and you know and I'm, I'm really glad that what i'm saying so far um <laughs> yes thank you jake thank you jake um you know that um you know that i think it just like i said it's like 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 certain ideas i thought like do this does this sound dumb but it's like it's kind of nice to have like some confirmation in the chat that it's like no it kind of makes sense well look at like this show um look at like this show where jake was able to like encourage the the fantasy aspect of it like like jake represented the immortals while you represented the mortals let's just put it like that um Ah, especially with Rogue exactly. So you kind of like, so the both of you going back and forth were kind of like giving me like, kind of like the both side, both ends that I'm trying to figure out, like how immortals look at it and how mortals look at it. So, you know, so it, it works out in the end. Not everybody, you know, it's like, it, but that's what gives me more realistic rules to work from, you know? Um Oh, uh, here we go. And she wonders how she reached a reader like me for Eager Raven. You're doing the thing that does. You're doing the thing that does. You're not approaching it for soul fantasy POV. You can make me understand what's going on despite the genre. Yeah, that's that's kind of uh, yeah, I guess. And I think that, and I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that I'm not like really like I like the fantasy genre. I like the medieval genre. You know, I like the aesthetic, but the thing is though, is that I'm not writing for a medieval audience. I'm writing for a, a modern audience and there are just certain things that I want. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like thoughts like that, random thoughts like that. Uh, it's like, Oh, I can't be asked about genres. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Um, 
yeah, it's like, you know, I want to be able to have some level of modernity in it of, of, you know, like what's going on now more about like, I don't want everything to be like, so very specific, you know, that's why the idea of like that foundation of a knight's tale in the Witcher was be- very freeing for me because it's like, I don't have to worry about, Oh, is this midi- is this accurate to the time period? And it's like, it's a fucking fantasy. I can do whatever the fuck I want, you know? And I think that that, that allows me to make a better story, a more relatable story um, because of that, rather than like completely being focused on, on, you know, like, oh, it has to like be, you know, like it has to be accurate to 12th century Europe, you know? And it's like, no, it doesn't, (laughs) you know, it doesn't, it really doesn't, you know? Um, you know, so so here we are. Um, yeah, so so as you can see, I kind of was able to work on the piece of it. You can kind of see where it's beginning to build up and whatnot. Um, uh, hopefully, it's like I can get this this piece done. So I'm probably gonna do this piece in pieces because after the show, I want to go back to doing more pages for Eagle Raven issue eight. So I'm going to work on that uh, because, again, I want to get enough done so that on the weekends I have more sketching, more, more commission sketching to do. Um, I have to finally ink, uh, sketch out some some uh, artwork for Jose for his next Oswald book. So I have to spend time on that. So I want to get as much done by Friday um, uh, to, to, you know, to to you know to, to get to that get those pieces started and then just continue and, and also um there's some pieces for for that i'm doing with the crossover for sky of thorns uh with krista crawford for um the unicorn king's daughter we're doing a crossover on kickstarter so there's artwork for that that i want to get started as well um uh, because i want to be able to show off some stuff next time i do my stream you know so that you know we're, we're you know there's a lot going on but you guys know there's a lot going on so ah so here i am top a a little a little after the two hour mark uh but like i said i could have just continued talking about this world building thing i mean i love talking about the creative process and trying to figure this stuff out and um and you know in a second i hope that you guys got something out of it um it it, you know um (laughs) You know, I, I mean, it's like, you know, the artwork, you know, you know, it's nice to look at, but I, again, I didn't finish it, but um, I, I was just happy to be able to hash out a lot of stuff imagination wise. So uh, for uh, future stories. So, um, and, and yeah, so, so yeah, so that's, um, oh, oh that, that, and there's our boy right there. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so here we are. Thank you so much to everybody who joined me in the chat. Patrick, Jake, Joe, uh, Joseph. Um, I know that there's, uh, I know that there's a, a, a Neko, uh, Lucky Neko, um, uh, Michael, uh, Gothic Lolita Angel. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining me in the chat. Yes. And thank you so much to the eight eyeball people who, who have been watching me this entire time uh, for the two hours. I hope you were kind of, I hope you were at least entertained by this conversation about world building and how I think about Um, what's important to a story, what's not important and how we can get both of these things to work. Um, You know, it's like, I I really do like talking about the process. It's a lot of fun. And, and I thank you all for joining me uh, today. So um, yeah. So in the end, uh, yeah. So Thank you so much. And if you want to read more, uh, you want to see more about uh, my artwork and read more about me and my artwork, learn more about my campaigns and whatnot, um, you can go to my main portfolio site at egoworks.com right up here, E-G-O-W-O-R-K-S, where you can find links to all of my galleries and social media sites. They're also listed here too. But I mostly post on Facebook if you're interested in seeing sketches and current work in progress and live updates about everything. And uh, I, uh, yes, and you can also find me on YouTube here on YouTube at my channel at Daphne Lage, L A G E Art, uh, which also simulcasts through the Indie Comics Network. So make sure you like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you get notified whenever any of our shows go live. 
And remember, you can read Eager Raven, Air the First Unicorn, for free, uploading every day, Monday through Friday. But if you prefer your fantasy to be more of a furry Lord of the Rings adventure, uh, follow the link over to Tall Tales, T A I L S. T-A-I-L-S dot com, online dot com, talltalesonline.com, Jesus. And not only can you read the first 20 issues of Tall Tales for free, you can catch up on the latest story arc, Tears of the Mother, which is also currently uploading Monday through Friday. Remember that Tall Tales, or so I thought, the first full color Tall Tales comic is on Kickstarter right now in its last 41 hours. You have until Friday uh, to pledge to the campaign, either start off your Tall Tales collection or complete the whole thing by getting all of the trade paperbacks available uh, on this campaign. But if, if you prefer more Eager Raven, she will be returning to Kickstarter August 2nd with issue seven uh, of the series out of 15. We are really, you know, going strong here. So all the links are in the show notes below. Uh, for you to, uh, you know, either pledge the Tall Tales campaign or click on the notify me button so that you get notified when Eager Raven goes live. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I will see you again Friday at 11 a.m. where we're closing out um, Tall Tales, or, or so I thought. Join us then. We'll have whatever conversation, whatever uh, other conversation that we're going to have, including a close at the campaign. So thank you so much again, and I will see everybody next time. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here?